Good evening and welcome to our program. This series is focusing on This Is Your FBI. This Is Your FBI was a radio crime drama which aired in the United States on ABC from April 6, 1945 to January 30th, 1953 for a total of 409 shows. The show featured true cases from the FBI and was told from an FBI agent's viewpoint. FBI Chief J. Edgar Hoover gave it his endorsement, calling it our show and calling it the finest dramatic program on the air. Generally, I do not include advisories. Given Hoover's polarizing nature, I will share this. Dramatized stories created for propaganda purposes are not history. They tell one biased side of the story, and in no way am I saying that these are reliable stories. I just believe them to be interesting when viewed through the scope of entertainment and weird history. Finally, I'd like to send a specific thank you to publicdomainreview.org and archive.org for organizing and compiling all of this media. If you would like to listen to standalone media, we have included a link in the description.
The Equitable Society presents This is Your FBI. <laughs> This is your FBI, an official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. Through your FBI, you look for national security, and through the Equitable Society for financial security. These two great institutions are dedicated to the protection of you, your home, and your country. Tonight's file, The Allotment Swindle. The war has now been over officially for 13 weeks, and all through the land, castles that crumbled two and three years ago are being rebuilt, being rebuilt because our servicemen are coming home. From torrid China, from freezing Alaska, from hungry Europe, from all over the world, men are returning to this, their native land. In every man's life, There are moments of sheer exultation that tighten the muscles in his throat that make speaking impossible. Such a moment is being enjoyed by men this very day, being enjoyed as they sail into New York Harbor, sail in past the lovely lady who still holds high the flaming torch, the torch they help keep lit. Our story this evening opens in a small, unattractively furnished apartment on the west side of New York. Julia Parker, a sleazy blonde of 28, is half asleep in the second-hand Morris chair near the window. She is daydreaming, thinking of some of the men she could have married, and of some of the men she did. Okay, okay. Yeah? Julia? Yeah? Open up, it's me, honey, Bobby. Bobby who? Your husband. Why, ha... Julie. Julie, baby. Oh, gee. Oh, it's you. Oh, honey, it's so good to see you. Gosh. Come on in. Uh, Oh, sure. Just let me grab hold of this bag. There. Oh, gosh, baby. (sighs) This is what I've been waiting for. When did you get in? Yesterday. What a time I had trying to find you. This is the fifth address I tried. I moved. Gee, you look swell. Uh. You know, I used to dream about this. And I'd be laying in a lousy hole filled with mud. I'd think about you You and... getting out of the army? Yeah. I got a 30-day furlough. Then I go back to camp. Guy gives me a paper, and I'm a civilian. Oh. Glad to see me, baby? Sure. It's wonderful. Let me hold you again. Uh. Gee, you know something? What? I almost feel, well, embarrassed about this. What do you mean? You know, like we were strangers or something. Strangers? We only knew one another a couple of days before we got married, and me going right overseas. Well, let's get over that. From now on, we're going to be together for a long, long time. Right, baby? Yeah, sure. Hey, I uh, got a couple of things for you in the bag. Present? Yeah. What kind of present? Oh, helmet, Nazi flag, pictures. Oh. You want to see them? Um, not right now. Oh, I can get them. No, wait. Let them go till after, huh? Okay. Uh, I got to go out for a minute first. What for? Well, you must be hungry, and I haven't got anything in the house to eat. Oh, but... Look, you get all cleaned up or something, huh? I'll be right back, honest. But, Julie... Just make yourself at home. I'll see you later. Hi, Aunt Julie. Still around? Yeah, he's down the end of the bar. Hmm. 
Phil. Hmm? Oh, hiya, baby. I gotta talk to you. Okay. No, not here. This is important. All right, come on back to the office. Okay. Matter, you got trouble? Yeah. What is it? I'll tell you inside. Go ahead. Yeah. What's wrong, kid? Bobby's home. Bobby who? My husband. Which one? The blonde one. Bobby Chase, I think his name is. The Marine or the sailor? The soldier. Oh. What am I going to do, Phil? How'd he find you? I don't know. He says he went to five addresses. Tough giver up a... Well, after all, it was important to him. I'm his wife. It says here. Look, this is real serious, Phil. What am I going to do? What does he want to do? He wants me to live with him, naturally. <laughs> that wouldn't be fair to the other guys. It huh? wouldn't be fair to you. Besides, what good is he now? What do you mean? He's getting out of the army. No more allotment checks. Oh, that's different. Where is he now? At the apartment, waiting for me to come back. I told him I was going shopping. I got to get back, Phil. Yeah. All right, go ahead. Well, ain't you going to do something? Well, look, give me some time, will you? I'll have to figure an angle on this guy. I'll get in touch with you tomorrow. Back in the early days of the war, Phil and Julia hit upon the racket of having Julia marry servicemen who were about to be shipped out of the country. They repeated the process three times. And with the aid of two forged birth certificates, Julia was able to get $100 a month in dependency allotments. $100 a month for each of her husbands. It was a pretty good racket for Phil and Julia, because all they had to do to collect their $300 a month was to wait for the postman to ring. Three times. Yes, it was a very good racket. And no one knows how long it would have gone on if the war hadn't suddenly ended. With the return of large numbers of servicemen to this country, allotment discrepancies began to turn up. Began to turn up in such alarming numbers that the Federal Bureau of Investigation was called in. That morning in the New York offices of the FBI... Oh, come on in, Lee. Okay. What's up? I've just been going over this list here. Well, tell me all of those people are wanted. No, I guess maybe most of them are here by mistake. At least, let's hope so. Well, what is the list? Suspicious allotments being paid by the Army's Office of Dependency Benefits. All of these names are in the New York area only. Well, it'll take the whole Bureau to investigate that mob. I don't care if it does. Neither does Mr. Hoover. If they're all guilty, we'll bring them all in, even if they have to build a dozen new jails to hold them. How are you going to go about it? Well, first I thought we'd make a spot check on the whole list and get a percentage. Good idea. Then we'll know approximately how many of the whole mob we'll have to deal with. We'll make a uh, 5% check. Oh, sounds like enough. Suppose I take the list and have a new one made with 5% of the names. Go ahead. Now, how do you want me to pick the 5% at random? Just have Miss Jenkins list every 20th name. Then break that new list down by neighborhoods. Right. When they're ready, we'll go to work. Mac, it's Phil back in his office. Yeah. Thanks. Excuse me, please. Hiya, Julie. Come on in. I was just thinking about you. Well, that's very nice of you. I thought you were going to get in touch with me. I didn't have anything to tell you. Well, I get plenty to tell you. What's the beef now? The guy is driving me nuts. All day I got to sit around and look at souvenirs. And what he said to the captain and what the captain said to him. <laughs> okay, okay. And that ain't all. Remember that extra dough he sent home for me to save for him? That 2800 bucks? Yeah? Well, he wants it. He wants it right away. What'd you tell him? Well, I couldn't say I gave it to you. I said it was in the bank. Well, that ought to hold him for a while. Phil, he wants the dough right away. He's going to buy a lunchroom or something. And another thing. Yeah? He wants me to go meet his folks. Where? Boston. When does he want to leave? On the midnight train tonight. Look, Phil, you got it. Wait a minute. I got an idea. 
Well? Tell him you'd love to meet his folks. Tell him you're going with him. Only you don't take the train. You want I should walk? Listen. Go back and tell him your brother will drive you both up. My brother? Yeah. Me. Phil, he can't meet you. Why not? Well, if he was to know about us. Look, all he has to know is I'm your brother. I'll take care of the rest. What's the idea? You'll see. This guy is good for one more touch, baby. A big one. Bill, would you like me to drive for a while? No, no, I'm okay. <laughs> Bill likes to drive. Well, with a road like this, I don't blame him. How was the driving on the other side, Bobby? Oh, not so good. Even when we found a good road, it was full of shell holes. Guess you had kind of a rough deal, huh? Yeah, it was rugged sometimes. Bobby don't like to talk about it much, Phil. I'm getting out next month. I want to forget about the Army. Sure, sure. I can't envy you, though. Must have been a great experience. I tried to enlist myself. Yeah, I know, Phil. Bobby, tell me something. What? Did you guys ever think about dying? Phil! I'm just asking a question. We thought about it plenty of times. Well, you have insurance, don't you? Oh, sure. GI insurance. I got $10,000 worth. That don't help much if you stop a bullet, of course, but at least I know Julie'd be okay. That was very sweet of you, Bobby. Well, can you keep that insurance up? Yeah, sure. I'm keeping mine. Just for me, Bobby? Hmm. Just for you. Uh-huh. Uh-oh. What's the matter? Oh, that left rear tire feels a little flat. Where till I take a look at it? Oh. Um... You need a light? No, I got a flash right here. Yeah, it's going flat. Guess I'll have to change it. Can I give you a hand? Yeah, okay. Get the jack and the lug wrench from the back there, will you? Sure. It's open. Just lift it up and reach in. All right. Can I help, Phil? No, no. Just stay put. Here they are. You want to set that jack under there? Yeah, sure. How about here? That's fine. <laughs> What happened? What do you think? Oh. Now I'm an heiress. We momentarily close the Equitable Society's presentation of the FBI file on the allotment swindle. We will return to this case in just a moment. One of the most meaningful words in the English language is security. According to the dictionary, it means freedom from fear, anxiety, or care. Freedom from doubt or uncertainty. To one man, security calls up a picture of a little house which he owns free and clear, so that no one can ever take it away from him. Another man thinks of protection against the hazards of illness and accident. A third sees himself receiving a regular monthly check during his old age. A fourth wants to be sure that no matter what happens to him, his children will get a good education and his wife will never be dependent on charity. For 86 years, men and women have been bringing these and scores of other security problems to the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Now, please take particular note of that word, society, in the Equitable's name. Society means that the Equitable Society is entirely owned by its members, that is to say, by its policyholders. In other words, all the officers and employees of the Equitable Society, from President Parkinson down, are working for the members and are always ready to give problems their personal attention. So, no matter what kind of financial security a member may seek, he can be sure that the Equitable Society will do its utmost to help him attain that freedom from fear, anxiety, or care which makes him a happier man and a better citizen. 
Yes, by serving its members, the Equitable Society serves America. And now back to the file on the allotment swindle. The basic ingredient in the character of a criminal is greed. The unhealthy desire to acquire what belongs to someone else without doing any work. Phil and Julia, being well supplied with greed, had evolved a novel racket. A racket particularly well suited to the times. Julia's three illegal marriages to servicemen about to be shipped overseas, so she and Phil could defraud the government out of the allotments, was a serious enough crime. But now, with their greed out of control, they had compounded the felony. They had committed murder. Bobby's body was found the next morning and quickly identified as the body of Private Robert Chase. It was removed to the local morgue, and the death was marked down as having been committed by a hit-and-run driver. The next afternoon, in the New York office of the FBI... Can I come in, Nick? Come ahead, Lee. How have you been doing? I think I may have something. Really? Yeah. I paid a call a couple of hours ago on one of the names on our list, a Mrs. Robert Chase. Yes? Well, before I could even identify myself, she gave me a very teary greeting and went into a long spiel about her husband's insurance. Oh? It seems he was killed last night in a hit-and-run accident up in Massachusetts. I see. You evidently thought I was the insurance man. Well, when I told her who I really was, she seemed quite startled. Hmm. What's her background? According to the allotment records, she's been getting money for herself and two children. You check on that? Yes, I talked to several of her neighbors. They've never seen any youngsters. Where was the hus- husband killed? Near a town called Highland Mass. Lee, I think this one's worth a thorough investigation. Special Agent Price telephoned the morgue at Highland, Massachusetts and learned that the Army was claiming the body the next day to take it for burial with military honors in the Chase family plot. Because of his suspicions, Price ordered the body held for further examination. And that night, he and Special Agent Adams left for Highland. The next morning at the morgue... Here's the body, gentlemen. Poor devil. Yes. Is there anything on his uniform, Doctor? Any marks? Yes, there were some tire marks where the car had apparently run over him. Well, what do you mean, apparently? Wasn't he run over? Yes, he was, but... But what, Doctor? Well, that isn't what killed him. He was killed by a blow at the base of the skull. How do you know that? Well, there was blood there, and it was clotted. If he had been killed in the accident with the car, and then sustained the injury to his skull, the whole appearance would have been different. Can I join you, Doc? Oh, yes, Joe. I want you to meet Mr. Price, Mr. Adams. They're from the FBI. This is Joe Benton. He's with our local police. How do you do? Know, I heard you were coming, gentlemen, so I got this stuff ready. What is it? It's a set of plaster casts of some tire tracks. Now, how'd you get them? Isn't the road paved? Yes, but these were off the road. They're real good ones. It rained the night before. Tell me, did the tracks show that the car backed up about 15 feet? And then when it started forward, it went back onto the road? Yeah. Doesn't seem to be much doubt from what Dr. Jones says. The private chase was murdered. Well, how do you figure that? Well, let's assume that he was murdered by the people in this car that ran over him. They want the murder to look like a hit-and-run accident. Yeah? So they drag the body out onto the road and back up and run over it. Yes. So thanks for having the foresight to get these casts of the tar prints made, Benton. Oh, glad to be of any help. Now, Dr. Jones. Yes? One more thing. Can you tell me what instrument was used on Chase's skull? Well, I'd say it was straight, like an iron bar. I see. Thank you, gentlemen. Oh, that's okay. Goodbye. 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 Should I call New York now and have him pick up Mrs. Chase? No. I don't think so. Why? Not yet. Don't you think she did it? I think she was in on it, but she's not smart enough to be working alone. You want to put a watch on her? Yes. She should lead us where we want to go. Just a minute. Who is it? Hey, Phil. 
Oh, okay. You got my message, huh? Yeah. Gee, I thought you'd never get here. I got so scared, Phil. I didn't know what to do. I was How going How do you know around. the guy was from the FBI? He showed me a badge or something. What do you want? Well, nothing really. Talk sense, will you? He must have wanted something. Well, he said he was looking for some guy broke out of jail. Why'd he come here? He said they were looking all through the building. Now, that was a phony. Did he ask about your husband? No, he didn't seem to care about that. Uh-huh. Not even when I told him he'd been killed. Well, how'd you come to tell him that? I thought he was the insurance man. Oh, you stupid... Well, how was I to know? We ain't seeing any insurance man. Why not? We got a bump steer on that 10 G's. How do you mean? You don't get it no lump. I checked up today. You get a measly 36 bucks a month for life. Oh, that's awful. Well, that's the deal, sweetheart. And you may not even get that. Why? FBI came here for some reason, and I guarantee you it's not the one they gave you. How would they know anything was wrong? That happens to be the business they're in. Oh. What do we do? You got to blow town. Oh, fair. And fast, baby. You're getting out tonight. I can put you up at Chuck's place for a couple of months. In the country? Yep. With all them trees? Baby, it's better to look at trees than be hanging from them. Meet me at my garage at 12 o'clock tonight. Say, Nick, I've got the report on the Chase children's birth certificates. Fakes? Like a $3 bill. I thought so. Well, what do we do now? Well, one thing we've got to do is to see whether our candidate has a car. Well, who's our candidate? I wasn't here when he was nominated. A fellow named Phil Taylor. How does he fit into the picture? Well, he endorsed every one of Mrs. Chase's allotment checks. Well, who is he, a check cashier? No, he's just a petty larceny crook. Done time a couple of times, but all small stuff. Well, if he's mixed up in this, he graduated to the big leagues. Yes, if this is the man we want. What else have we got on him? He paid a call on Mrs. Chase this afternoon. Well, why don't we grab Taylor? We can't prove anything against him yet. It's not against the law to cash government checks, you know. You don't look as unhappy as you should. I'm gambling on a hunch. I'm having a check now. Anything else come in from the Massachusetts police? No, not a thing, but they did enough. Price talking. Yes? Yes. Yeah, let me write down those dates. That's fine, thank you. That was Johnson down at City Hall, Lee. Yes? When Robert Chase was married, his bride gave her maiden name as Julia Prescott. That was a mistake. Why? Because two years before that, on September 11th, 1940, this same Julia Prescott was married to our suspect, Phil Taylor. <laughs> Phil, I don't like this one bit. Ah, country air will do you good. Oh, sure, sure. Why don't you come along? Because I happen to have a business to take care of. Well, I ain't staying up there any two months. You can bet no on that. Look, baby, if the law nails you, two months will seem like a real short time. I got a good mind to go back to one of my other husbands. <laughs> Stop your beefing. It's open. Hmm? You don't need no keys. The garage door is open. That's funny. Come on. Wait a minute. I'll put on a light. Okay. Just stay oh. where you are, both of you. Who are you guys? This is Chase, should remember. He's from the FBI. That's right. What do you want? We've been comparing this plastic cast with your left rear tire. It matches perfectly. Phil! This lug wrench is important evidence, too. Well, you get your way, Julie. You ain't going to the country. On the strength of the evidence uncovered by the special agents of the FBI, Phil and Julia Taylor were tried and convicted for the murder of Robert Chase. The racket broken up by the FBI tonight was a wartime racket. But do not labor under the misapprehension that the underworld will not find peacetime rackets. They will. The FBI will continue to stamp out as many rackets and as many racketeers as possible. The FBI can help. 
But only you can really put a blockade on the underworld. Only you, by a concerted effort, can starve them out of their positions and force them to seek other means of livelihood. The servicemen now coming home after years of privation are returning to a country they have been dreaming about. They deserve to have you do your part to make their dreams come true. You'll hear about next week's case in just a moment. This week at the Equitable Society, I happened to go up in the elevator with the secretary of the society. You know, he said to me, I'm a very determined man. About a month ago, my wife started talking about buying a dog, a Scotty. I said, no, dogs bark, I said. Dogs chew up rugs. Dogs have to be walked. We're not going to have a dog, and that's that. Well, he continued, that little Scotty and I are great pals already. He's the friendliest little pup you ever saw. Sure, my face is red, but I'll bet a lot of Equitable Society members know just how I feel. I'm thinking of all the people who say they don't want any life insurance, don't need any life insurance. And then one day you hear them bragging about how smart they were to buy it, especially from the Equitable Society. Yes, it's a great business we're in, this Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Think of how many happy people there are in this world because an equitable society agent kept on trying. Think of all the old folks that are enjoying security and independence. Think of all the kids who are getting good educations because someone from the equitable society didn't get discouraged, didn't quit. And that's why it's so important for every one of us in the equitable organization to keep plugging not to be disheartened by the perfectly natural human instinct to say no. Yes, for only by keeping our organization alert and progressive are we able to say that this week and every week for 86 years, the Equitable Society has been building security for you, your home, and your country. Next week, we will bring you another colorful story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, the Bobby Sox Bandits. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Society's broadcast are taken from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Programs in this series of particular interest to servicemen and women are broadcast overseas through the worldwide facilities of the Armed Forces Radio Service. Tonight, the music was under the direction of Frederick Steiner. The author was Jerry D. Lewis. This is your FBI, is a Jerry Devine production. This is your narrator, Dean Carlton, speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community, and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time for This is Your FBI. This is the American Broadcasting Company. The Equitable Society presents This is Your FBI. This is Your FBI an official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation 
presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. To your FBI, you look for national security, and to the Equitable Society for financial security. These two great institutions are dedicated to the protection of you, your home, and your country. Tonight's file, The Bobby Sox Bandit. Seventeen. That's an important and exciting age in the life of a boy or a girl. Some of you girls listening tonight are just seventeen. Finishing high school or starting your first real job. Or having your first real honest-to-goodness date. Going hiking or wiener roasting with the gang. Or sitting in the middle of the floor with your Vic and a stack of records. Doing most anything except making it possible for this voice to say as it reluctantly says now. Tonight's case from the files of your FBI is the crime story of two girls, age 17. It's just about sundown, and on a highway out of Pittsburgh, two girls with one suitcase between them stand by the side of the road. This ain't good. Huh? We picked the wrong road. There ain't been a car pass here for 15 minutes. What, Bonnie? We ain't grabbing no lift. Oh, that's okay. I'm catching up on what I should know. About what? About Hollywood. This is a wonderful magazine. The whole thing is about Barry Brooks. Bonnie, you just ought to read movie magazines. I already have. But you just ain't read about Barry Brooks. (sighs) Ah. He's so wonderful. Brooks, Smooks, we gotta get a lift. Bonnie, when we get to Hollywood, I'm not gonna eat or sleep until I see him. Uh Uh-huh. Look at this picture. What did you write on there with your lipstick? Never mind. Let me see it. Love Me Forever, co-starring Barry Brooks and Phyllis Tyler. Oh, Phyllis. Laugh if you want to. But I'll star in a picture with him someday. Yeah, yeah. I never had any real feeling about my destiny until I saw Barry Brooks in his first picture. I saw it six times. And right from the very first, I just knew that my destiny was in his hands. I Wait a minute. Knew... Here comes the only destiny I'm interested in. Huh? Oh. Oh, I hope he stops for it. Yeah. Look, he's going to. Can I give you young ladies a lift? Oh, sure. We've been waiting for you for an hour, mister. Then hop right into the back seat. Okay. Gee, thanks. Go ahead, Phyllis. Okay. All right back there? Sure. Yeah. I don't make a practice of doing this kind of thing, but it was coming all night, and I didn't like the idea of you young girls being on the road by yourself. That's awful nice of you. I'm going on to Cleveland. How far are you going? Oh, we're going all the way Well, we're going to my sister's in Detroit. Detroit? But Bonnie... Certainly Detroit. What's the matter with you? Well, I didn't mean to be inquisitive. I was just thinking about you having to travel this way. I've got a daughter about your age, and I know her mother and I would have a... Oh, Oh, wait a minute, mister. Could you stop the car? What's the trouble? Uh, I think I dropped something back there when we got in. Drop what, Bonnie? Um, my bracelet. Bracelet? Well, I'll just back up. Is the road clear behind? Uh, yeah, yeah, it's clear, all right. Good, then we'll just... Mm. Bonnie, no use thumbing rides when we can have a car of our own. Daly speaking. Headquarters, Mr. Daly. Looks like we got one for you FBI boys. Okay. Uh, a couple of girls slugged a man, stole his car just a little ways out of town a while ago. Looks like uh, interstate stuff. Uh, you got the details? Well, a man's here at headquarters getting his head fixed up. You want to come over? 
Well, give me a description of the car and the girls first, and I'll get out an alarm right away. Okay, here's a car. Black Plymouth Sedan, 1941, Pennsylvania license number. Wonder what town this is, Bonnie. I don't know. But it's in Ohio anyway. I wonder how long it'll take us to get to Hollywood. Now, how would I know? Wonder if that nice man is still lying in the ditch where we left him. Will you stop wondering so much, Phyllis? I'm sorry. Look, you just sit there and dream about Barry Brooks holding you in his arms, and I'll... Bonnie! Bonnie! That sounds like he's got a flat tire. Don't you think I've got ears, Phyllis? Oh, now what'll we do? What do you think? We'll just borrow another car. All right, good morning, Roland. No good. You're just in time, Daly. Huh? What's up? Teletype from the Cleveland office just came in. Oh? Huh? That black Plymouth sedan was found abandoned early this morning in a street in Niles, Ohio, with a flat tire. Uh, any uh, sign of the girls? No, they must have switched cars. How's that? Well, a man in Niles reported his Ford sedan stolen during the night, and the Plymouth was left about a block from his house. Cleveland put out an alarm on the Ford sedan? Yeah. Well, let's start traveling. Where? Niles, Ohio first. See if there are any clues in that Plymouth... We ought to be doing things like this to get to Hollywood. Hitting people over the head and stealing cars. Why not? Well, suppose they should find out sometime. Who? My public. What are you talking about? Well, suppose after I get started in the movies and I'm on the way to the top. Suppose it gets out that I got to Hollywood by stealing automobiles. Oh, stop. I'll be ruined, Bonnie. That'll be the end of my career right there. Don't be stupid. It'll be good publicity. And besides, all of this will make you a much better actress. I don't see how you figure that. Aren't the best actresses the ones who live their parts? Yeah. And what are the best girl parts in movies? It's, it's girls who work in gambling houses, who are spies or mixed up with gangs. Girls who live dangerously. Yes, you're right, but do we have to all the time steal cars? No. I've got another idea as soon as we get into Cleveland. What? We're going to ride in style on trains from now on. Where are we going to get the money? Somebody in Cleveland has money, and we're going to take it away from them. Here's that Plymouth, Mr. Daly. Just like we found her. Uh-huh. We towed her up here to headquarters. Never touched anything inside the car at all. Oh, that's fine. Now, if you'll give me a hand, officer, maybe we can get some clear fingerprints. Sure. All right. Wait, this may be something right here. Uh, what's that? Yeah, it's a movie magazine. <laughs> Not hard to tell who their favorite movie star is. Favorite one of them, anyway. Hmm? How's that? This picture of Barry Brooks has red lip prints all over it. Hmm. Uh. I guess you'll want to save some samples of the lipstick for your laboratory, huh? Well, this may be more important than the lip prints, this lipstick writing on the page. Uh huh. What's it say? Phyllis Loves Barry. Love Me Forever. Co starring Barry Brooks and Phyllis Tyler. Well, that must be one of the girl's names. Yes. But uh, what's that business about co starring? Well, I'd say the kid already imagines herself in a picture with Barry Brooks. Hey, that sounds like the girls are headed for Hollywood. Yes. Mr. Daly? Yes. Just got a call from Pittsburgh. Oh, what's up, Roland? The girls have been identified. Is one of them named Phyllis Tyler? Yes. How'd you know? Uh, she left her name on this magazine. Well, the other one's Bonnie Lawton. They're from Baltimore. Been missing four days. I see. And that Ford sedan they stole here in Niles has just been found abandoned in Cleveland. Well, I'd say that's our next stop. <laughs> Thank you. 
later that night, somewhere in the area of Cleveland's ore docks on the Lake Erie waterfront, Bonnie Lawton and Phyllis Tyler sat in a booth in the corner of a juke joint, sipping drinks. Look, Bonnie, the sailor's looking over here again. He hasn't looked at anybody else but you since we've been in here. Oh, this'll be easy. He's darling. Never mind that. Look, he's getting up. I think he's coming over. Well, I'll get out of here. Do like I told you, Phyllis. Remember? Oh, he's got the cutest smile. All right, but don't let it take your mind off business. Oh, excuse me. Excuse me. Hiya, Goldilocks. <laughs> you mind if I sit down? I beg your pardon. Oh, now, look. Don't play hard to get. You've been giving me the office all night. I couldn't help but look at you. You very much resemble Barry Brooks. The, the movie guy? Yeah. Hey, that ain't bad. Uh, is your girlfriend coming back? She just went down the street for a minute. Oh, that's fine. Uh, got any ideas about us? Well, we don't have to stay here. Well, then let's get going. Come on. Okay. We'll go to a joint where there's some dancing and stuff. Would you like that? Oh, sure. Right this way, honey. Which way did the girlfriend go? Down that way. Then let's go the other way. Silly. Say, um, what's your name, baby? Phyllis. Phyllis. That's very <laughs> cute. Uh, you live around here? Well, not really. I just got in town All myself right, last... All right, put him up, sailor. Huh? This is a stick-up. Hey, are you kidding? I said put him up. Get his money, Phyllis. Okay. Well, I'm a... Shut up. Oh, look, sweetheart, give me that gun. Sure, I'll give it to you. Oh. Now we travel first class. We momentarily close the Equitable Society's presentation of the FBI file on the Bobby Sox bandits. We will return to this case in just a moment. 324 years ago, the Pilgrim Fathers of Plymouth enjoyed their first Thanksgiving dinner on this continent and played host to 90 Indian braves of a nearby tribe. Apparently, the Pilgrims were unable to bag any wild turkeys for well, the menu mentions only venison, roast duck, roast goose, clams and other shellfish, eels, plums, and wild grape wine. Among the three and a quarter million members of the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States, some are bearers of names which indicate that their ancestors may have attended that banquet. Other Equitable Society members have names that indicate an origin in a more recent wave of immigration. But whether their names go back to the Mayflower or a boat that landed half a dozen years ago, Equitable Society members have proved that they believe in the time-honored American virtues of thrift and self-reliance. Their life insurance policies with the Equitable Society are good evidence that they believe in saving for safety believe in taking care of themselves by putting dollars aside for future security. And just as our forefathers banded together for mutual protection, so Equitable Society members have joined forces in a great mutual organization created for the common good of all. Self-reliance plus cooperation, that's the spirit on which this country was founded. It's the spirit which makes men and women better citizens and better Americans, which is a good reason for this organization to be thankful that by serving its members for 86 years, the Equitable Society has served America. And now back to the file on the Bobby Sox Bandits. Do you know where your own 17-year-old son or daughter is tonight and what he or she is doing? You probably do because you care. 
but hundreds of thousands of American parents don't know and don't care, and haven't known and haven't cared for so long that last year boys and girls under 21, and most of them only 17, committed over a third of all the robberies in the United States, over half of all the burglaries, nearly two-thirds of all the automobile thefts. The parents of Bonnie Lawton and Phyllis Tyler didn't care enough. And that's why we find them now in a cheap rooming house on Chicago's west side, after leaving a trail of crime halfway across the country. 380, 390, 395, 96, 97, 98. Gee, look, Phyllis, we're doing swell. You mean we've got $398? Oh, more than that. Here's another five. 403 bucks. Why did we stop here? That's enough to take us to Hollywood, isn't it? You don't want to get there broke, do you? But, Bonnie... And if you're going to get in the movies, you've got to have some swell clothes, don't you? Yeah, but... And suppose you do manage to meet Barry Brooks. I'm going to. So what are you going to meet him in? A pair of dirty slacks, scuffies, and a sweater? Golly. I hadn't thought about that. Then let's go get us a couple of good-looking outfits. And then what? With those, we can step out in the better spots. And take somebody for a lot of money. All right. But there's something else I want to buy, too. What? I read all about it. Barry Brooks collects all kinds of cigarette lighters. Oh. I'm going to get him one and send it to him from here. Okay, come on. Let's go shopping. That same morning, back in Cleveland, Special Agent Daly is just entering the field office of the FBI. What'd you find out, Daly? Well, the two girls who robbed that sailor last night were Bonnie Lawton and Phyllis Tyler. You sure? The sailor positively identified them by these pictures. Well, that's good, but that didn't put us any nearer to catching them. No, but something else I found out does. What's that? They took a midnight train for Chicago. How do you know? I dug up the night ticket agent who sold them the space. Well, we better phone there and have them cover trains going west. Well, they might be smart enough to stop off in Chicago and hide out a while. Yeah, but I'll phone anyway. Okay, and then we'll catch the next plane for the Windy City ourselves. Here you are, girls. Is this the light you saw in the window? Yeah, that's it. Isn't it, darling, Bonnie? It's okay. Do you think Barry Brooks will like it? Uh... Did you say Barry Brooks? Yeah, the movie star. I I'm going to send this to him. Oh, oh, I see. How much is it? Well, it's probably more than you want to pay. How do you know? How much is it? Well, including tax, it's $15. Oh, that's easy. Uh, oh, here. Say, where did you girls get all that money? None of your business. That's a pretty big bankroll. Do you want to sell us a lighter or don't you? Bonnie, let's get out of here. Okay. Keep your lighter, mister. Uh, just a minute, girl. Come on, Bonnie, hurry. Well, welcome to Chicago, boys. Uh, thanks, right. Tom. I'm afraid I haven't got any good news for you. Oh, no trace of the girls, huh, Turner? We covered all buses and railroads right after you called, but nothing has turned up yet. Well, they could have taken a bus or a train before we called. Well, all ticket agents have been checked, and they don't recall any girls answering the descriptions. Now, come in. Here's something just came in from the police, Mr. Turner. Oh, thanks. Well... They're in Chicago, all right, fellas. They tried to buy a lighter about noon in a little shop on Randolph for Barry Brooks. Yeah? The clerk got suspicious when they showed so much money and the girls ran out. You sure it's the same girls? Well, her description's checked and one of the girls called the other one Bonnie. Well, if they'll just stay here long enough, I think I've got a way to catch them. Phyllis, Phyllis, come on, wake up. Oh, well. Anybody think you were a movie star already the way you sleep all morning? Come on, wake up. Oh, hello, Bonnie. Have you been out already? Yeah, I went to the store. Did you get a paper? Yeah, here. Thanks. Want some coffee? Sure. Now, let's see. What page is the funnies on? 
I figure we can break in our outfits tonight, Phyllis, and make it pay off. I got a plan. Bonnie. Bonnie. What's the matter? Bonnie, listen to this. Barry Brooks. What'd he do, get married? No, he's here. Here in Chicago. Oh, Bonnie, think of it. Barry Brooks, right here in Chicago. Well, don't tie yourself in a pretzel about it. What does it say? Barry Brooks is believed to have slipped in Chicago last night. And according to reports, is staying at the State Hotel. And Bonnie... We're going over there. Wait a minute, Phyllis. Oh, it's destiny, Bonnie, don't you see? Barry Brooks and I in Chicago at the same time. Come on. You can't get in to see him. Of course we can. He's good about giving his autograph, and that's what we'll say we want. Come on, Bonnie, let's hurry. Well, uh, aren't you going to bother to dress first? Oh, oh, sure, sure. But it'll only take me a minute, and I can wear my new outfit. Oh, just think of it. I'm going to see Barry Brooks. <laughs> Girls, girls, girls. I'm the manager of this hotel, and I say you must go away. We're going to stay in front of his room until he comes out. Oh, Barry! Barry! Come out, come out! Oh, girls, please, please. I tell you, for the hundredth time, Mr. Brooks is not in the room. Oh, yes, he is. You wouldn't be trying to get us away. He is not. He is. He's not. He is. I tell you, he is not. Oh, yes, he is. <laughs> We want Barry Brooks. We, we want, want Barry Brooks. We want Oh, Barry girls, Brooks. stop, 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 stop. Girls, stop. Come on, move over. Let us through the door, please. Uh, what, what makes you young ladies think you can get in? We have an appointment with Mr. Brooks. You have an appointment? Oh, well, just knock at the door and you'll find out. Go ahead, knock. Barry! I am, um, I'm not Barry. Uh, Miss Lawton, Miss Tyler, will you come in, please? Goodbye, girls. Better luck next time. <laughs> Pardon us. Where is Mr. Brooks? Yeah, where is he? Well, I'm sorry to tell you the report in the paper about Mr. Brooks being in the city was not correct, girls. What? But we called up the room. And well, I'm a... responsible for the story being in the papers. I'm a special agent of the FBI. Bonnie, this is a pinch, huh? You're under arrest. Yes. Gee, I certainly had a very short career. Because of their extreme youth, Bonnie Lawton and Phyllis Tyler were put in a reformatory where every effort will be made to guide them to a better future. But far more serious than the sentence passed on the two girls was Bonnie Lawton's indirect charge against her own parents. In court, she said, I've had to learn everything else the hard way, so I guess I couldn't very well skip this one. The rising tide of juvenile delinquency in America amplifies that charge into a tumultuous indictment of the tragically large number of American parents who don't care enough for their children. America's homes are the birthplace and training ground of her citizens. What, then, is the hope for America's future? The answer is in the hands of you, the mothers and fathers of America. The FBI can protect only the lives and property and laws of America. You must protect its future through your children. something about next week's case in just a moment. This week at the Equitable Society, a group insurance serviceman suggested I take a trip with him. So the two of us jumped into his car and after an hour's ride, we parked at a large factory that has just taken out group insurance with the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. First, we got the president of the company's angle on the new insurance program. Among other things, he said, You know, since I started this business 25 years ago, I can't think of anything I've done that's given me more satisfaction 
than group insurance with the Equitable Society. I consider it a big step forward in our relations with our employees. A little later, we heard the same story in different words from a veteran worker. This group insurance is swell stuff, he told us. It gives me a real lift to know that I've not only got extra life insurance, but also hospital and surgical benefits in case anything goes wrong with me. Yes, there's no question about it. Group insurance is something on which labor and management see eye to eye and stand shoulder to shoulder. And that's why we of the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States take such pride in the fact that group insurance is an equitable first. This plan is one of scores of examples of the Equitable Society's leadership and progressiveness. One of the many reasons why we say that this week and every week for 86 years, the Equitable Society has been building security for you your home, and your country. Next week, we will bring you another colorful story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The Big Breakout. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Society's broadcast are taken from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Programs in this series of particular interest to servicemen and women are broadcast overseas through the worldwide facilities of the Armed Forces Radio Service. Tonight, the music was under the direction of Frederick Steiner, the author was Frank Ferries, and your narrator was Dean Carlton. This is your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. This is Carl Frank, speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community, and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time for this is your FBI. You know, it's kind of fun to plan what you're going to buy in future years with the bonds you're buying now. Maybe the woman of the house has her heart set on a new washing machine. Dad can see that new radio and television set. And the youngsters have super deluxe, extra special bikes and toys in mind. But buying time isn't here. New, low-priced goods aren't on the market yet. More important than that, we still have a debt to pay before we go on a spending tear. A debt to the veterans who fought in the war and their families. Many veterans will require hospitalization. Others will want loans and education. We have a debt in the war contract that were canceled with the coming of the peace. And that's why the government is asking us to buy bonds now, during the victory loan. This will be the last bond drive. It won't be long before we can go back to a facsimile of living as usual. But until then, let's put over this victory loan by buying that bond. This is the American Broadcasting Company. <laughs>